around 250 kilometers south of Hogada, on the shores of the Red Sea, lies a feeding ground for green sea turtles. This is the Bay of Abu Dhabab. Here in the crystal clear waters, only a few meters from the shore, sea grass starts growing in between the ripple marks formed by the waves, way until the deeper waters in the middle of the bay, where the ground becomes hilly and the grass grows thicker. It's early morning along the north side of the reef. The sun's rays now start warming up the cold sand on the shore, and one can see them dancing on the surface of the calm and clear water. Most mornings here unfold like this, as the wind and waves don't build up until later in the day. Together with the sun, a few early risers have found their way into the bay already and waste no time heading straight for their first meal. In a few hours, their numbers will have noticeably increased. Usually roaming the ocean as loners, these rich feeding grounds make green sea turtles head to the bay by the dozens every day. This meadow under the sea is not only a home for turtles. Other animals also live here and wander through it in search of food, or look over for a visit from the nearby reef. Once the turtles have made their way to the bay from their roosts after sunrise, they spend most of their time searching for food, browsing from plant to plant. Adult green sea turtles are herbivorous grazers, and therefore almost entirely eat seagrass. However, they also think about tomorrow. They try to take each bite thoughtfully, and if possible, merely trim the plants instead of ripping out large clumps along with the roots each time. That is easier said than done here, because the grass length in the bay is rather short. Therefore, extra care and a good eye are needed. Once its mouth is full, the turtle rinses it with water, thus transporting sand and other inedible particles back outside, also through its nose. Apart from seagrass, they also feed on other greens they find along their way. That includes red and green algae, crinkle grass and green seaweed. Only important that it fits their strict diet which is in fact so strict that even their body fat turns green. Yet there remains one occasional exception. A juicy jellyfish. If those appear in the bay after a stormy night, they end up being a welcome and easy to catch snack. All kinds of sea turtles eat them, and while leatherback turtles base their entire diet on hunting them down and follow them through the ocean, Green sea turtles just take a bite whenever one crosses their path. And contrary to popular internet belief, it remains just a snack. The turtle is not getting a high from it. Yet its thick skin and strong lining inside its throat, at least protected from getting stung. Virtually without enemies in these waters, the turtle can devote itself entirely to feeding and reproducing. Despite its disc-like build, it manages to move almost effortlessly across the ocean floor without stirring up too much sand. Its powerful front arms that feature a useful claw give it the support it needs, and when swimming, the turtle can steer precisely by moving its arms like a paddle, gliding slowly through the water, as well as diving up or down quickly when needed. 
and it is nothing short of remarkable to see with which grace and elegance these animals hover from bite to bite. However, there are more mysteries to this calm and serene creature than one might suspect at first glance. In their first years, green sea turtles actually set out as carnivores and prey on fish and their eggs, small invertebrates and crustaceans, before then changing their diet over time. From the moment they hatch on the shore, the turtles instinctively try to make their way to the deep blue waters in order to hunt and grow. Only years later, they return to shallower regions. Yet even today, no one really knows where they go, especially not in this part of the world, which is why this time in a turtle's life is often referred to as the lost years. In some cases, these years may even last up to a decade. Especially as small hatchlings, they're an easy target for predators, and as they grow slowly, only few make it to adulthood and return back to the coastlines. Here they then feed on the grass and grow as juveniles, before the females finally return to the beaches where they once hatched, in order to lay their eggs in the very same sand. This natal homing is possible, as the turtles are able to sense the intensity of the Earth's magnetic field, and use this compass to return home. As it takes up to 20 years before green sea turtles mature, the reproductive cycle takes very long. But once a turtle has actually made it back to the beach, it can look forward to a pleasant retirement and possibly wander around in the seagrass until its 90th birthday. Some of these old specimens, like this male, can reach a carapace length of up to one and a half meters and weigh more than 190 kilograms. Similar to old humans, once they have reached a certain age, not everything works just as well as when they were young, yet their movements are still every bit as graceful. And the seagrass, for sure, tastes just as good when you take a bite while floating head first toward the ocean floor. Having lived a long life, this turtle definitely would have more than one story to tell. Of the seven species of sea turtles in the world, five are found in the Red Sea. And the green sea turtle is by far the most common. However, the name is somewhat misleading, as the green turtle can also show colors of brown, yellow, or black. While hatchlings start out with a black carapace, the color usually changes to a brownish tone over the first years, before beautifully colored dots or dashes can appear later. Yet the general pattern of the scapes on the animal's head and back, despite all differences, is by no means random. Their plastron underneath is yellow in color, and their carapace always consists of five central scutes, surrounded by four pairs of lateral scutes. Additionally, the dorsal area on their head has a single pair of scales. Adult males can be easily identified, as they have a larger tail between the hind flippers. Yet the most fascinating detail to me is that they all display a minimalistic pictograph of their species right on top of their head, even though this depiction needs a little fantasy. Although the turtle spends most of its life underwater, it frequently needs to break the surface to breathe. When it is time to rise, it slowly glides upwards while carefully monitoring its surroundings. Once it floats and the coast is clear, it lifts its head out of the water for a deep breath. If 
the water is calm and the turtle feels comfortable, it might stay at the surface to take in four or five more breaths before again heading down to the grass. The turtle's dive might now easily take up to 20 minutes before it returns to breathe again, depending on how far and how fast it swims. Just as with divers, stress dramatically increases air consumption, which is why turtles easily drown when tangled in fishing nets. Life in the sea can be lonely at times, which is why a lot of turtles here carry one or more friends around. The remora, or more commonly called, suckerfish. These mostly green fish attach themselves head first to larger marine animals and use them for both transportation as well as protection. Temporarily, their host might even be a boat for as much as they care. Despite their lazy looking life choice, they actually swim well on their own, but prefer to stay close to their host as they have developed a special relationship. As the turtle passes through the grass, sometimes a good bite floats around as well, and the remora can safely pick it up. Yet its main source of food is much less glamorous, as it feeds on its host's feces. Turtles make an especially easy target for the fish, as even if they are annoyed by the passenger they carry, they cannot simply reach back and get rid of it. The fish even stays with them while they are heading to the surface to breathe. Yet for their troubles, the turtles also receive some benefits in return, which makes this a symbiotic relationship. As the remora moves around the host turtle's carapace, it picks up parasites and also helps to slough epidermal tissues in areas the turtle cannot reach on its own. Win-win. Yet for one ever-recurring inconvenience, even the remora is no help. Sand. It naturally accumulates on the turtle's head and back, and despite the fact that its shell is made out of bone, the scoots are formed out of keratin, just as human fingernails. And with turtles, these contain nerve ends, making them sensitive to both pressure and touch which means that the turtle can very well feel the sand crumble on its back and therefore is eager to scrape it off. When swimming in the open, the front arms can take care of its head. Yet for its back, it needs to find a more creative solution. For more thorough cleaning, the turtle makes use of suitable structures it finds on the seabed or reef. In this case, one of the anchors in the deeper parts of the bay is quite a popular spot. While visitors are sometimes under the impression that the turtle is entangled and in need of help, it is really just taking advantage of the rope and rough edges of the anchor and gets to clean hard to reach areas around its body. Who doesn't enjoy a spa day? every once in a while. Rope and anchor make clear how even man-made objects can be taken over by nature, below as well as above, providing shelter for the next generation. With the sun now climbing higher and higher, something is about to change and temporarily shift the balance in the bay. Not only do hotel guests now take to the sea, 
but also vans and buses arrive at the site, bringing in tourists that have left their beds early in order to only once have a chance for an encounter with the turtle or swim at the pristine North Reef. The beach fills quickly and so does the sea. Don't get me wrong, there's no fault with groups visiting this unique place and thereby ever more increasing its popularity, as long as everyone acts responsibly and shows respect for both the reef as well as the animals around them. And most visitors do that. Their guides brief them on the essential do's and don'ts of swimming with marine life before taking them to the water, one after another. A guided swim can be an excellent choice to explore the bay, especially when the guide is truly local and can help you discover details you otherwise will likely miss. And turtles, though easy to scare, get used to having visitors at the surface after seeing them day after day for years, and when you give them enough space and time to breathe, will not be harmed by the trouble. Yet some groups tend to ruin it for everyone. People head out to the deep waters lacking even basic equipment, only wearing a mask and bathing suit. Some guides don't even bring one flotation device for an entire group, which is especially reckless. Barely keeping themselves afloat, they will now circle at the surface and wait for a turtle to rise for a breath, and not all of them will keep the necessary calm and distance from the animal. And some people are only satisfied once the entire world has felt their touch. As if the stress of taking a much needed breath is not enough, touching a turtle now puts it in serious danger. In their decades long roam through the ocean, their bodies have built up a biofilm of bacteria that protects them from parasites and disease, and a human touch poses a serious risk of breaking this barrier, which may lead to unnecessary suffering or even the animal's death. Additionally, the constant hustle at the surface leads to dramatically shorter dives, as the turtle will mostly only take one quick breath before rushing back down to safety immediately. It is important to understand that a turtle that heads to the surface does not come there to play. It comes there because it is in dire need of fresh air, and exploiting that is dangerous. Nonetheless, I really love to see this place thrive, and I want everyone to experience this magnificent sight with their own eyes, as it really is magical. But if you come, do it the right way. There are local pros in and around the bay that will gladly show you all this place has to offer and more, and with their knowledge, ensure a safe and responsible experience for everyone. Because just as the turtles do it with the grass, it is important not to leave too much of a footprint behind, so that also tomorrow, this paradise will still exist and isn't washed away from shore. This includes the reef, the bay, and everything else that makes this area so unique. Here along the coast of the Red Sea near Masa Alam, you will find beauty in every corner, between the colorful corals in the reef, as well as in the open waters. So much so, that a single day visit is hardly enough to explore it all. With the last vents taking off, also the turtles leave the bay, heading back to their sleeping spots for the night. Before it all starts again, with sunrise tomorrow. <laughs>